computers were going to take over the world. This was going to be the end of the world. And then I got a degree in computers, and I said, oh, that'll never happen because they never stay on. <laughs> if you know anything about computers, you know that they're not stable. Amen. You can be the most computer savvy whiz, and uh, they lock up and do what they want to do sometimes. Amen. 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 Everybody blessed today? Amen. Amen. So good to see everybody in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. There's no better place to be on Sunday. Thank God it's not raining outside right now. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I hope everybody's blessed and uh you know, last week we talked. We started talking about, you know, myths against uh, the gospel of grace and, and uh, things that uh, can be said against, you know, some of the things that Pastor Larry and I teach. And, uh, you know, we just, we wanted to bring them to everybody's attention, Pastor Larry, because, um, you know, we want you guys to know, you know, what we believe and why we believe. And, uh, you know, we, we might be teaching something that's a little different than a lot of other people in, in the city. Amen. Right. And so it's important to know. You know, if uh, why, like we always say, it's important to know why you believe what you believe, amen, and to know, and if it's something that's, uh, you know, kind of unique to our city, as, as Pastor Larry and I are, are teaching, you know, it's good to know why, particularly we believe what we believe, amen, amen. and, uh, you know, we were talking about different myths of the gospel of grace, and, uh, you know, one of them last week, Pastor Larry, was that, uh, you know, people will say that we're against confession, amen, that we don't teach that that uh, that basically we're quote unquote against confession, right? Like like we say that you shouldn't confess your sin, mm-hmm. but we looked at that you know in a little bit in depth, you know, and and we just looked at it and we saw that you know no we're not saying that you can't confess, amen. If you want to confess your your sins to the Lord, but what we are saying is that we particularly believe that it's it's wrong to say that unless I confess, then God is not going to turn His face back towards me, right. amen. So in other words, like if I don't verbally confess my sins to the Lord, then God won't ever, you know, be pleased with me again. Amen. Amen. And we kind of looked at that to say, like, if you look at it, we're always sinning every day. You know, amen. Because Jesus said, for in particular, we looked and said, Jesus said that if you, if you, you know, look at a woman with lust in your heart, amen, you may not have done anything physically, but if you looked at somebody with lust in your heart, you might have all... You might have uh, went ahead and just committed adultery already, you know, in your heart is basically what he said. So it's it's saying that, you know, we're all going to fall short of the kingdom of God every day. Amen. And so if that's being if that's being true and if we would all agree to, the, to that, then we have to see and, and believe that you would have to confess like a billion times a day. Right. Amen. Right. <laughs> if that was the case, you would have to confess each and every individual sin. And you would just be constantly confessing and confessing and confessing. So the logic isn't there. Amen. And so uh, it's not, we, and we came to the conclusion that, you know, it's not wrong, for instance, to, to say, you know, Lord, I, you know, I'm sorry for my sins. But know that God has already forgiven you. Amen. Even right. when you've made a mistake. Yes, amen. And, you know, we likened it to a, like a father and a son relationship. When you make a mistake, your father doesn't wait for you to come and verbally say, you know, Dad, I'm sorry. Until he forgives you, Amen. You've already forgiven your child of that sin that they that they made, right? Yes. You've already amen. forgiven them, Amen. And so, I mean, yeah, maybe it, it it hurts you, maybe a little bit what they did, but you're not going to turn your back on them and and not you know not love them anymore until they verbally confess their sin or say I'm sorry, right? So there's nothing wrong with that, Amen. But we just said it's wrong just to say that you know until you do it, then you won't be forgiven. Until you do it, you know, thank God. We'll turn his face back to you, Amen. And so we looked at we looked at four different myths last week, Amen. And so this week we're going to look at four more, Amen. And then next week we should be done, Amen. Mm-hmm. I just wanted you know to say that biblically, you know, just just from a scriptural a scriptural point of view, there's not one scripture that teaches the believer to confess their sins. That is a myth, you know. And people say, what if the word repent, Pastor Larry? The Bible says to repent. Okay, for the sake, you know, stop, stop for just a second. Stop just throwing stuff out there that you don't even know what it means. 
You understand? What you're Sometimes we just quick to throw something out there, and we've never studied it ourselves. It's because our favorite preacher told us that. You know, the word repent does not mean to confess your sins. The word repent is made up of two Greek words: meta noia. Meta is where we get our mind. Meta, like metaphysic, and noia or naus. It comes from the word naus, means mind. Change. I'm sorry. Meta means to change. To change. Noia is where we get the word naus, which is mind. So the word repentance is metanoia, to change your mind. Yes. That's what the word repentance means. It means to change your mind. It doesn't mean to confess your sin. It means to change your mind. Yes. Yes. And I was, when I was studying this, you know, I was going to tell Pastor Jamie on my way here. And, you know, Grandma, the more I study this thing about grace, Brother Edward, the more I just get rooted in it. And the more I just see that there is no other gospel Amen. than the gospel of grace. You understand what I'm trying to say? And I feel that, you know, the word repent, it doesn't mean, you know, to confess your sins. It means to change your mind. Let me ask you a question. If you got to confess your sins, how many sins, does, what sins do you confess? Just the ones that you do physically? Like having sex outside of marriage? What about when you doubt? The Bible said whatever is not a faith is sin. Yeah. Do you confess your doubts? Do you confess every little time you, you, you look at something and you shouldn't look at it? You understand what I'm trying to say? Yeah. If we did that, Brother Stanley, we would be living sin conscious. What about, let's say you were to hit your finger with, with, a, with a hammer and a cuss word came out of your mouth and you dropped dead the instant you said that. Do you think, do you think God would send you to hell because you didn't confess that sin? Hmm. No. You say, y- y'all all say no. But why is it that we're so quick to hold on to confession? Come on. Because if it takes confession to be forgiven, then you better make sure you get down to the nitty gritty. Amen. Now, I, now I ask another question to you. The Bible says, Sister Mary, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Right. Notice the words, Lily. Without the shedding of blood, there is no. It doesn't say without confession, there is no forgiveness. See, it takes blood to be forgiven. Yeah. Amen. 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 And we're forgiven according to the blood of Christ. Amen. Now, Amen. I'm going to say one last thing and then we'll move on. In the Old Testament, Pastor Larry, how can you say that? That sounds heresy. That sounds like false doctrine. Okay, hold up. Let, let me ask you a question. In the Old Testament, how long did they have forgiveness? All year. All they had to do was offer an animal and they were forgiven the rest of the year. Mm-hmm. That was under the Old Covenant. Mm-hmm. How much more the blood of Jesus is greater oh, yes, than the good. blood of bulls Amen. and animals. If they had yearly forgiveness, and you're telling me we only have forgiveness until the next sin that we commit. Come on, you're that's telling good. me that the blood of Jesus is mm. cheaper that's right. than Amen. animal sacrifices. Amen, that's good. No, Ooh, my friend, good. the blood of Jesus is greater Amen. than the blood of animals. Amen. So if God gave them yearly forgiveness because of a bull, you and I have eternal forgiveness. Yes. Because Hallelujah. of the blood of Jesus. Yes. Yes. And so just, just remember that. And you know what? I, I love what you said, Pastor Jamie. I'm not saying that you can't ask God to forgive you. I'm not saying that. Or you can't be transparent with the Lord. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that the moment you think that Jesus is like when you go to the casino and you pop in your forgiveness and pull it, pull down the handle, and he shoots out the coins of forgiveness. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> that's the way we are. That's, that, that's our Christianity. We, Jesus is a lotto machine. Even when it comes to offering, give the 10%, pull the handle, and he shoots out a blessing. <laughs> that's ridiculous. My father, my father loved me. My father is not alive. I'm going to use my father again. My mother and my father did a lot of things in their life that I'm not proud to say that, to say. I would be ashamed to say some of the things that they've done. But you know what, Mary? My parents are not even alive. But in my heart, Mary, if they were here, I've already forgiven them. Amen. Even though they've never asked me. Yes. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. Amen. How much more... If I would do that for my parents, and I'm a natural man, yeah, how much more our heavenly Father that yes, loves us yes. Yes, would say, you know what? I have already forgiven you before you ever asked. Amen. 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 And when you know that God's forgiven you, the Bible says this: 
to him that knows that they're forgiven much will love much. Amen. Yes. Yes. When you know you're forgiven for your, your life, you'll love him with everything in your heart. Amen. Yes. And the freedom Amen. of God's grace. Amen. I, I believe that's what I believe that's what true true forgiveness yes, is. is. You know, like when you truly when you truly experience that that true forgiveness from the Lord. You know, like you said, it leads you to want to go out there and love more. That's right, man. But if you're walking around with this constant, you know, mindset that, you know, every time I trip and fall, God is is turning his back on me. Yeah. You know, you can't you can't effectively you can't be an effective Christian, you know, when you're living like that because you have this this rain cloud following you everywhere. You know, every time you make a mistake. But the proper way to do it is, hey, we're all going to make mistakes, right? How many of y'all make mistakes in this room? Yeah. Amen. <laughs> and when you make mistakes, the best thing to do is just say, God, you know. I messed up, but I know that you've already forgiven me. Amen. I know that you Amen. still love me. I know that yes. you said that you would be with me even until the end of the world. Amen. Amen. He'll never leave you or forsake you, right? right? He didn't say, if you mess up, then I'll leave you. He said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. Right. Amen. And so when we can when we confess that and believe that, amen, you're 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 able to love much. Amen. amen. You're able to be a more effective Christian. Good. Amen. So I just wanted to say yeah. <laughs> People say, How do you and Jamie do it? We just go back and forth and don't even think about it. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So is everybody good? Amen. Yeah. You're good? Yeah. You're good out there? Amen. So I guess yeah, go ahead. I guess Okay, so we're gonna continue, amen. We're gonna do a few more myths today. So the title of our series has been uh, Myths About the Gospel of Grace. Amen? It's, it's, these are not everything that people disagree with us about. Let me tell you something. We're not saying that we disagree. A lot of people don't disagree with us. They misunderstand what we believe. Amen. There's a difference. It's not that they, they disagree with us. It's that they don't understand. You know, when we say things like, we don't believe in tithe, they automatically, oh, well, y'all don't believe in giving. No, we never said that. You know what I'm talking about? You don't have to confess your sins. So I can sin and do whatever I want. I'm, we didn't say that either. You see, don't get the cart before the horse. Yes. Listen yes. to everything that's being said. Amen? So number. So that's why we're doing this series, is just to clear up some of the things that we believe. Now, myth five that we're doing today, we did one through four last week, yes. correct? Yes. Now we're doing five through eight today. Number five, the myth is God is not grieved by, by our sin. Some people believe that we say that God is not grieved by, by our sin. Amen. Amen. So it's like saying, um, it's like saying, okay, well, you know, you guys are saying that we're we're forgiven and, and and all this and that. Well, they would turn around and ask, you know, well, does God care when we sin? Then are you saying that God does not care when we sin, or that God is not grieved by when we sin? And it's just like what Pastor Larry just got through saying. Okay, so you're saying that God just doesn't care when we sin. You know, well, like you said, slow down. You know, let me elaborate a little bit. But, you know, I I believe that God is grieved when we sin. Yes, he is. Amen. So let's say, you know, we, we, all, we all believe we're forgiven, we're saved by grace and all that. And then we make a mistake, like I said. I believe that God is grieved by that. Amen. Just like when your son or daughter makes a mistake. It hurts you to a certain extent, right? When they do something you wouldn't want them to do, right? It, it pricks your heart a little bit. But let me ask you a question: Are you, are you, are you uh, going to just turn your face to that child when they make a mistake? Mm -hmm. No. Well, if you're a good parent, you wouldn't. Amen. So if you're a good parent, you wouldn't just turn your face to that child. It hurts you, but that doesn't mean that you just cut that relationship off completely, right? And you want them to do better. Right. Because they're your son, because they're your daughter, right? Gotcha. That you want them to do better, to live up to your last name, and to, and to you know to just be the person that you raised them to be, right, brother Tim? But it it, it still doesn't take away from the fact that it's gonna that it that it hurts you a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. And I believe that way is the same way with God, amen. Whenever we sin, Pastor Flurry, I think that it 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 grieves God, you right. know, it grieves God to a certain extent, to where He doesn't want that for us, because God wants us. God, He wants us to live His best life. Amen. It's like like Pastor Joel says, it, your best life now, right? right. God wants you to live your best life now, and you know I believe that when you're when you're when you're living you know in sin or, or when you're when you're constantly making mistakes, that's not God's best for your life. Amen. Right. And I believe that I believe that it hurts God. Amen. He wants you to live up to the to, to that name. Amen. Because when you were born again, church, if you don't know it, you took on God's last name. Amen. 
Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. The Bible says that you, you, you transferred from a servant into a son. So yes. you're your family now. You're no longer a servant working, working, working for God to obtain favor from God. You're in his family now. So now you're blessed because you're simply because you're in the family. Amen. Amen. You have a place at the table because you're in the family. Amen. Amen. Servant slaves don't have that. That's right. Mm-hmm. Servants and slaves, they work and work, and maybe there will be a place at the table, but it doesn't matter. You know, maybe there will, maybe there won't be. But a son, a daughter will have a place at the table no matter what Amen. because Amen. they're children, right? Yes. The same way with God, church. We have a place at the table. Amen. You know, and, and, you know, yeah, we make mistakes, we fail, but and it hurts God. But like I said, just get up, dust yourself off, and move forward. Amen. Amen. One Good. of the scriptures that we want to give you all is Ephesians chapter 4. In verse 30 to 32. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30 to 32 says, And do not grieve, they grieve, right? grieve, the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind one to another. Oh my! Can we read that again? Everybody, read that with me. One, number one on the count of three. One, two, three. And be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. So right there, somebody can say that. Amen. Do you know somebody tender-hearted? Amen. I know some Christians that are not tender-hearted. Uh, tender-hearted. That's another message. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> we'll say that for next week. <laughs> but look what it says. It just says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Do yeah. not grieve, you know, the the God that we serve. And I like what Pastor Jamie just said, just to elaborate on it again, it's the fact that God loves us so much that when we go into sin, God knows that sin is going to hurt us. <clears throat> Amen. Now, how many of you this is not to condemn anybody, but like, can we be a little transparent this morning? Amen. How many of you know that no parent wants their children to have kids at a young age? Amen. That when they don't have their life together, right. a home, and all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. How many of y'all parents are, would not, are not okay with that? Amen? Or, Amen. Well, you don't want that for your children, right? Okay. Amen. Nobody wants that. It happens, and maybe you were one of those people that got married yeah. and the stuff young. That's yeah. That's fine. I'm just using that. <laughs> my grandma's there. How old were y'all? 14. 14 years old. Oh, my goodness. 50 years in December. Amen. Praise the Lord. So, yeah, you know, they got married young. My grandparents got married young or whatever. But as as I'm sure her parents, which is my great-grandparents, they probably didn't want that for her. You know? It grieved them. But she did it nonetheless. Now, praise God, the Lord's. They've had a strong marriage going on 50 years. But y'all get my point, right? The fact is that that's the way God is. God says, you're grieving me. You're grieving me not because you're you're against my word. or No, you're grieving me because sin doesn't hurt him. Sin hurts us. Yeah. When we're disobedient, it hurts us. It damages us. And come on, church. We can all admit that there's times in our lives that we kind of you know, put our Bible to the side, Emma. And say, hold on, let me put my, my God right here because I'm about to get in the flesh. Yeah. And I think you start doing certain things your way, right? And when you're at the register, that mouth gets to going. And when you start cussing the register clerk out, and then you look down, you're like, I got my new company shirt on. <laughs> you see what I'm trying to say? Wow. One of our shirts, please don't do that. <laughs> yeah, don't wear our shirts when you yell at the, at the register. But you know, and it grieves God. It grieves God. Why? Because God's saying, Man, Brother Tim, you're better than that. Yeah. And you're my son. And I don't want that for you. Yes, I it, it's going to hurt you. It's going to destroy you. But if that's what you want, hey, God's going to let you have it. Amen. Amen. Uh, let me give you all another scripture. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. Amen. It says... Uh, it says, for the wages of sin is death, mm, that's it. but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. So, if you read your, if you read your, the epistles real closely, like Romans, Galatians, Ephesians, what you hear Paul saying is that you're a child of God. Amen. Amen. You're born again. You're saved. You're in God's family. And then always, like, usually towards the end of his letters, he always starts changing his, 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 um, his tone a little bit and he says because you're a child of God 
now stay away from these things right. because they'll hurt you. Mm-hmm. Amen. <laughs> Just like this scripture saying in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the wages of sin is death. Amen. You know, we can be Christians, holy rolling, flopping on the floor, talking in tongues, Christians. Amen. Right. But it doesn't matter. If we sin, there's consequences to that. Yes. That's Amen. That's right. The wages of sin is death. Right. Amen. 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 I say that because I've, I've known Christians, Brother Tim, that have... have you know that have been in predicaments and situations where you know they they begin partaking in certain things that they shouldn't be partaking in brother edward and they think that you know well i'll be fine or you know or they'll have this mindset well i can handle it or something like that Mm -hmm. but let me tell you you can't amen because the wages of sin is death and it'll eat it'll eat at you amen And, and i always see them deteriorating and just eventually you know just not even coming to church anymore amen why because the wages of sin is death, amen, and it'll cause, it'll cause death to come in your life, whether you're born again, Christian, saved or not, amen, so you always have to turn your eyes back on Jesus, amen, and so, so we know that, and we see that, so the reason why I read this scripture to you is because, you know, God, like Pastor Larry saying, God cares, you know, and he cares about when we sin, we're not saying that, that grace teaches us just to turn a blind eye to sin, amen, it doesn't, but we are saying we are saying that God does choose not to remember your sin no more. Right. Amen. Now, there's a scripture that says, I don't, we don't have that one written down, but it says that I will remember their sins no more. Amen. Mm-hmm. You know, God chooses not to remember our sins anymore. Amen. We have to believe that because that's in the Bible. But we're not saying that, you know, grace just teaches us to turn a blind eye or God doesn't care about when we sin. He does care about a church when we sin. Why? Not because we broke the rules right. or not because he's disappointed in us. He cares because it hurts us, and because it'll 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 eventually cause us to go down the wrong path. Yeah, yeah. man. So that's my take on that. Okay. I, and I, um, you know, I'm reminded of uh, just the fact that you can't you can't not want to do something and not pay the consequences. You know, if you put your hand to the fire, you can't say I want to touch the fire, but I don't want to get burned. Yeah. There is consequences for your actions. You know? And let me tell you something. Some of us in the church, we need to stop saying. God, why am I in this predicament? Yes. Well, maybe you're in this predicament because you don't know how to manage your finances. Come on. Amen. 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 Maybe you're in this predicament because you're hanging around with the wrong people. Amen. Stop Amen. blaming God for your consequences. Amen. Right. Amen. Amen. God, God gives us free will. Yes. God gives us free will. And when we choose to go down on a wrong path, God is so loving that he steps back and he says, do you want to do it your way? Go ahead. When when you fall, I'll be there to pick you up. But I'm gonna let you fall. And I, as as much as I preach, we preach grace from this table, and we always talking to y'all about the love of God and God loves you. I believe God does love you, and that's our message. But don't get it confused that you know what love will let you fall to where you're at the rock bottom of the lowest of lows. Because you know what, prideful people don't see the need for help. Only humble people. That's right. Amen. And sometimes you got to be humbled in your situation. Amen. And sometimes God will allow you to go through that to, so you can see that you need Him. Amen? Uh, I'm reminded of Luke chapter 22. You can write this down. We're just giving out some scriptures to reference. Luke chapter 22, verse 31 through 32. This is Peter, Jesus talking to Peter. And it says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I pray for you, that your faith should not fail. And when you return to me, strengthen your brethren. So notice what he says. Simon, Simon, I pray. So this is Jesus saying, you know what, Simon, or Peter, I pray that your faith would not fail. But how many of y'all know Peter failed and he denied the Lord? So did Jesus protect them from the consequences? No. No. Jesus allowed Peter to go through the consequences. But at the end of all things, the Bible says that Peter was restored God restored him God allowed him to be restored back is there music on season? God allowed him to be restored and I think that that's one of the things that we can't forget is the fact that even though he failed God allowed him to fail but God restored him so and then, you know also Pastor Larry you can for just for another example uh, we don't have a scripture but you can think about how Adam and Eve fell you know, Adam and Eve fell in the garden, but, you know, God, 
really didn't turn his back on them either. No. Amen. You know, so that's that's just another, you know, quick example. Amen. Amen. And you know, um, I wanted to share, you know, I always think like when, when I hear somebody say like, you know, well you and Pastor Larry are teaching that, you know, we can do whatever we want or, you know, or they say, Oh, so you're saying we can do whatever we want, we can sin however we want. What I hear is like, Oh, so you're saying we can touch the hot stove then. Amen. Right. <laughs> you know, it's like it doesn't make sense. It's like you, you touch the hot stove, but what's going to happen if you touch the hot stove? Get you're going to get burned. Amen. And it's just, if, you, if you partake in that stuff, you're going to get burned. Amen. If you right. dabble in that stuff, you're going to get burned. Amen. And, and that's not God's best for your life. Amen, somebody. Amen. Right. Do y'all understand that? Y'all understand? Okay. I'll plug the HDMI on the computer. On the top, on the computer on the top uh, right, right side. Right side. Yeah, the one on the right side. Yeah. I'm taking it off. We really don't need that. Right? We don't need it, really. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. So, okay. So that's myth, the, the myth number five. Amen. Oh, and I just want to say that the whole point of the grieve not is because we just want to let y'all know that we're just saying that God is grieved, but we don't agree to the extent that people would say God is grieved, therefore God is in a swivel chair. And he turns around and he says, Emma, did you repent? Okay, you asked me to forgive you. Okay, I'll turn back around. No, God doesn't do that. God's always facing us. <clears throat> even even when we are in our failure, Amen. God is still there. Yes. Amen. Amen. Uh, the ne- the next myth is myth six, and it says that we believe basically that they would say that we're against the law, against the law. And uh, let me say this to you: we are for the law. We are for the law but for the reason that it was actually given. Now, we say things like, we're not under the Ten Commandments. Y'all hear that? Y'all hear it say that. We're not under the Ten Commandments. We're not under the law. We're free from the law. And people freak out. You know, and they say, well, y'all are against the law. You're saying that we're not under the Ten Commandments, so you're not for the Ten Commandments. No, we're not saying that. We have to back up. But sometimes before you just jump the gun, you have to think about what you're saying. I am not against the Ten Commandments. I am, I am for the Ten Commandments for the reason that God gave the Ten Commandments. Are you with me? Yes. And listen to me. God never gave the Ten Commandments so that you could be obedient and earn righteousness. That's it. Mm-hmm. Are you with me? Amen. And that's the thing that we have to remember is that we are not against the law. We are for the law for the reason God gave the law. Amen. 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 So, I mean... You know, show me. You know, just show me a scripture where it says that the law is for is our standard for a Christian standard to live. Amen. Oh, you right. know, where where is that in in the word? It's it's nowhere in the word. You, there's not one scripture that says that the law, the, the the Mosaic law is what we're talking about, church. The Mosaic law, the Ten Commandments, is so that you can live by them and be holy. There's not a one scripture in that, but there is a scripture we'll find out that says that the law was was not to was not to keep us from sinning the law was actually to get us to sin amen it was to, it was to entice sin inside of us amen now what's y'all to turn to Romans chapter 3 uh, Romans chapter 3 verse 19 through 20 it says now we know that whatever the law says it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. That's it right there. So, by the law, can anybody be justified in his sight? No. 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 Amen. And that's all, we're, that's all I'm saying. You know, that the law cannot justify you. Amen. So, heeding to the law and obeying, you know, commandments and rules is not going to make you righteous. The one thing that's going to make you righteous is the blood of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Putting your faith in Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody. Amen. 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 Putting your faith in the blood of Jesus is what gets you righteous. Amen. The law, I don't want to get ahead of myself, Pastor Larry, but the law was to, the law was basically to point us to Christ. It was to say, it was so that we can look at it and say, this law demands perfection. It does. The Bible says that the law basically demanded perfection from us. 
And we're supposed to look at it, Brother Edward, and say, okay, this demands perfection, but I can never do that within my own strength. I cannot uplift to this perfect law of God. This law is holy. This law is just. This law is good. And in me, there is no good thing. But how am I going to do this then? How, how am I going to become righteous? Well, that's when Jesus showed up and said, you can't do it, but I can do it. Amen. So put your faith in me and then I will declare you righteous. And the Bible says that just like Abraham believed and it was counted to him for righteousness, that's how we, that's what we do. Amen. We believe and, and the Bible says that God counts us righteous. Amen. So how are we saved, church? Believing in Jesus Christ, putting your faith in the blood of Jesus Amen. Christ. Amen. Amen. I, I just want to show, uh, this is something that I taught on Thursday night, but if you go back a page in Second Corinthians, I mean Romans chapter 2, Romans chapter 2, oh, I just lost it. Romans 2. Romans two. Oh, that scripture you said, Jamie? Romans that was three, uh, Romans 3, verse 19 through 20. Oh, verse 14. Chapter 2 of Romans, verse 14. For when Gentiles say, that's me, that's me. who did not have the law. <clears throat> I can't say any here. Did y'all see what it says? Yeah. It says, for Gentiles who do not have the law. Yet people want to bring, you know, how many of y'all know the biggest thing in the, thing, the, the world today is that God wants us to, people are saying, we need to put the Ten Commandments back in school. We need to put the Ten Commandments back in school. That is baloney. Because God never gave the law to the Gentiles. God gave the law to the Jew. None of us are Jews in this room. Now, I know we're all spiritual Jews, but none of us are natural Jews. And the only people that God gave the Ten Commandments to were the Jews. Now, back to chapter 3 that Jamie read. The, 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 the myth was, are we against the law? The answer is no. We are not against the law, but we are for the law for the reason that God gave the law, right? The question is, why did God give the Ten Commandments and the law? Was it because he wants us to put them in our house and try to obey them? And that's the wrong answer. Look at what the Bible says. Chapter 3, verse 19. Again. I'm going to read it again, Pastor Jamie. Is that all right? It says, now we know that whatever the law says, it says those who were under the law. Who was under the law? The Jews. That Why? So that every mouth may be stopped and the world may become guilty before God. So why did God give the law, the Ten Commandments? So that every mouth could be guilty before him. Good. You, you're supposed to look at the Ten Commandments and say, I can't be obedient to them. I can never keep them off. So my job is to run to Jesus and say, Jesus, I can't do it, but you can do it. Amen. 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 Well, the Bible Amen. says, uh, one more, I'll read one more scripture then and then I'll let you okay. say something. Uh, Romans chapter 5. I believe this is it. I'm using a different Bible, so y'all, y'all bear with me. Romans chapter five, verse twenty. I want y'all to look at it in your own Bible, so you don't say this is what they're teaching over there, and you covet it. What does the Bible say? Romans chapter five, verse twenty. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. The law entered so that sin could increase. Yes. Pop quiz. Mm -hmm. Why did God give the law? So that sin can increase. increase. But yet your favorite preacher tells you God gave the Ten Commandments because they're God's moral standard of holiness. No. God gave the Ten Commandments and the law so that in, so that sin can increase. Let me say it this way. God never gave the law to make you sinful. God gave the law to bring out sin that was yes. already in you. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Yes. Yeah. People say, Pastor Larry, how can you say this is the Ten Commandments? Go read Romans chapter 1 all the way to chapter 7. By the time you get to chapter 7, Brother Edward, he says specifically, the law killed me, and he tells you what law it was. Thou shalt not covet it, which is the Tenth Commandment in the Ten Commandments. I don't, I don't know how they can't be any clearer than that. So the law, we're not against the law. We're for the law. Why did God give the law? So you can be guilty before him. So you can shut your mouth and realize you're in need of a Savior. Hallelujah. So that sin can increase in your life. Go ahead. Yes. Amen. 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 Where, where did we leave off? From the uh, five? I read. Pastor, I jumped up. Yes. Can I add something to yes. that? Yes. You just said 
Because if you go on to read to the next one, it does say the law was added so that trespass might increase, mm. but where sin increased, grace increased all the more. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. That's good. Amen. That's why we preach grace. Yes. Amen. 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 So uh, just jump over to Romans 7 now, just a couple chapters over. And look at Romans 7, verse 7. Go ahead, Pastor Tim. This is my favorite one. It says, um, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. I want you all to say that with me. Certainly not. Certainly, Certainly not. not. Certainly not. Amen. <laughs> On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said you shall not covet there it is amen so what is thou shalt not covet that's one of the ten commandments yep. right in verse eight but sin taking opportunity by the commandment mm. the law sin taking opportunity by the law produced right. in me right. all manner of evil wow. desire for apart from for apart from the law sin was dead wow. That's wow. It. amen i was alive once without the law but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. Amen. So when the law came, sin revived, and he died. And the commandment, the law, verse 10, which was to bring life, I found to bring death. So let me stop right here, and then I'll read the next few verses. So what is he saying right here? This commandment, this law, this good, the tenth commandment, well, one of the Ten Commandments, which was to bring life, he said, actually produced in him all manner of evil uh, desire, I think is the way he said it. And the reason why is because what Pastor Larry said, because there's sin in him already. And so the law took advantage of that sin we had in us and enticed that sin. Amen. So the law, well, I'll, keep, uh, I'll read more. But the law, church, in and of itself is good. The law in and of itself is holy, just, and good. We can't argue with that. But the reason, but the, but the problem is, is that the law can never get you to be good. Amen. That's you all understand it. that. Amen. The law is good, but it cannot make you good. Right. Amen. And so that's why there's other scriptures that say the law is obsolete. Amen. That Christ is the end of the law. Why? Because it can't make you good. That's so we it. don't need it. We have Christ. Amen. And Christ yeah. is the thing that makes you good. And look at verse 11. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceives me, and by it killed me. So the sin, take, uh, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived Paul, and it killed him. And then in verse 12, therefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Amen. You see, so he ends it right there by saying, it's good. And remember that the, the question in verse 7 that he asked initially, is the law sin? Certainly not. Because that's what people were going to talk, tell Paul about. They were going to say, okay, you're saying we're not under law, so you're saying that the law must be bad then. Well, no, I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that the law cannot make you good, church. Amen. And then um, I'm going to read one last scripture, okay, okay, and then we'll be done with this Let me say one thing. We're Go going. ahead. I have a study Bible. Just so you all know, this is not. This is a study Bible and that I bought at the Bible bookstore. And I don't know who wrote this Bible, but I like what they say about So you all won't think that we're the only ones saying this. Whoever wrote this study Bible says this about that verse. The law makes sin known and is used by sin to produce death. Hmm. So you know what the law does? Pretend I'm sin and I'm living in you. And you're preaching law and you're, you're feeding me law. I'm just growing bigger and bigger and bigger. How many of y'all know a kid? Have you ever saw a kid that you tell them? The more I tell them no, it's like the more they do it. Right. Yeah. That's the way the law is. The more you discipline yourself and say, I'm not going to sin because the Ten Commandments tells me. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. The more you start doing that, the more that sin is going to rise up. That's right. That's good. Putting yourself under work. Amen. 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 Um, that's like I used to say, you know, if, if, there was a, if there was a big sign on that door right there that said, do not enter, and you were here by yourself, would you enter that room? Yeah. <laughs> Some of you probably would, right? I say, oh, well, but you probably would. Now, if we were all here together, you wouldn't do it, right? But if you were alone and that, and your curiosity would start to peak, right? You'd be like, I want to see what's behind that door, amen? Even though it says, do not enter, amen? That's what Paul is saying that the law does, amen? It puts before you saying, do not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. And all that does is entice you to want to do more, amen? If you look at 
If you look at the book of Exodus, when the children of Israel were given the law, when, when Moses walked up to the mountain and he got the law, the Bible says he was given two, two tablets at the beginning, right? When he came down, immediately after the law was given, Moses came down and they were already sinning. They had built a golden calf. Right. Amen. So immediately after they put themselves under law, they're already finding out that they can't do it. They're already breaking the first commandment. Have no other gods before me. And that's why Moses smashed the commandments and went up and got two more. Amen. And the Bible says that 3,000 people died. Amen. So the law brings about death. Amen. But, you know, I just want to say this. You know, how many of y'all know this? How many of you have been in? I came out of hardcore Pentecost. I mean, they preached hellfire to us. And, you know, I came out of the church where women had buns on the back of their head and dresses. And the thing is, is that I was taught this. Love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. If any man loved the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Hallelujah. Amen. Stop going to the bar. Stop going to the Pan American, you know. And, and stop listening to cumbias. And, how many of y'all were taught that? Or got that impression in church. And the funny thing is, Nora, is that I never studied the Bible because nobody told me how to study the Bible. But when I actually started studying the Bible, and I started reading, because I've read the Bible from front to back. I don't say that boastfully. I'm just telling you, I've read it from front to back several times. And one of the things that I realized, Omar, is that when Jesus said, love not the world, he wasn't even talking about the bars and the drinking. Because you would find Jesus at those places, yeah. reaching the lost. What does it mean to love not the world? Well, if you study the word world there, it means that world system, that religious system. So you know what God is actually saying in a sense? He's saying, don't love religion. For if any man loves the religion, they can't love the Father. Amen. See, he's trying to pull the Jews out of Judaism. You know, we, we think, you know, our, we always trying to stay away from the sinners. Well, in reality, we need to be embracing them. Amen. Because the ones that killed Jesus were the religious. Amen. The Pharisees, the Sadducees. You don't see the, the, the drunks and the adulterers trying to kill Jesus and plot against Jesus. They were hanging with Jesus. It was the Pharisees. Uh-oh. The Pharisees, the ones that believed in the Ten Commandments, yeah. believed in Moses, and they said, we don't need you, Jesus. We got Moses. And Jesus said, you'll die in your sins if you don't believe in me. Mm. Good. Amen, Why? Amen. Because God is saying, I'm, I'm doing a new thing, a new covenant. Amen. Amen. And uh, before you jump to that one, I wanted to jump to this one, if I may. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. First Timothy, you you want to really write this one down. First Timothy chapter one, and I'll just read it, and I'm not going to elaborate on it for time. But First Timothy chapter one, verse. We'll just start with verse eight. But we know that the law is good. Say the law is good. The law is good. If one uses it lawfully. In other words, the law is good if you use it right. Oh, how many righteous people in this room? How many of you say you're on your way to heaven? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Everybody, let me see. Okay. So y'all are all saying you're righteous. Correct? Okay. Y'all just said it. God's watching. Look at verse 9. Knowing this, that the law is not made uh -oh, for a righteous person. <laughs> that's good Emma did you see it that's what it says it says that the law is not made for a righteous person that's right I don't need to say any more I don't even need to put my commentary on it it says it as clear as day yeah. Yeah, I don't think we need to elaborate any more on that amen if you're righteous then according to 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 9 the law is not made for you Mm. You don't need the law because you have the Holy Spirit living in you. He'll tell you. Amen. He'll tell you what you need to do and what you not need to do. Amen. Amen. You don't need a set of rules in your home to tell you don't do this, don't do that. Yeah. Church, yeah, you, know, you got to understand the reason why Jesus came in the first place. It was to pull people away from the law. Amen. It was to pull people into Him and say, don't depend on the law, don't depend on your system, your religious system any longer. Trust in me. Amen. Look to me. Amen. You don't need that, church. Amen. So last scripture for this myth, and then we'll be done. Uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 24 through 25. Mm, come on, Pastor. Galatians chapter 3, verse 24 through 25. It says, Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Mm. So what was the law? It was a tutor, tutor. to bring us to Christ. 
that we might be justified by faith, not by works. Verse 25. But after faith has come, after Jesus has come, we're no longer under a tutor. So after wow. Jesus has come, we're no longer under the law. Mm. Amen. So <laughs> you, know, you, can't, you can't get any clearer than that, church. We, if, you're, if you're righteous in Christ and you're trusting in the Lord to be your righteousness, to be your salvation, you're trusting in the Lord, then you're no longer under the law. The problem is, is that we have a lot of people, Pastor Larry, that want to put themselves under law and Jesus. They want to put themselves under both. And the way it works is they'll, they're living for Jesus and then they go to the law and they're trying to uphold the law, trying to keep all the commandments, trying to do everything they're supposed to do. And then when they fail, they run to Jesus and say, Jesus, forgive me. I sinned. You know, make me whole again. And then when Jesus makes them whole again, then they go back to the law again, mm-hmm. trying to live the law again. And then they fail. It's a constant, um, how do you say it? Like a hamster wheel. You're constantly going back and forth. But Jesus says that your 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 righteousness, Brother Edward, your holiness is found in me, Amen. not the law. But you're divorced from the law now. Yes, you are. Amen. So, if you're under Christ, you're you're not you're no longer under the tutor. It says it very clear that the law was just simply to bring us to Christ. Are you are you to Christ now? Are you in Christ now? Amen. Then you're no longer under a tutor, like the scripture said. Amen. Amen. Somebody. Amen. 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 But I just, I, I just want all I will say is that in Galatians, my favorite chapter of Galatians is chapter four. Abraham has two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. The Bible says that Ishmael represents the law. Isaac represents grace. And the Bible says that Sarah told Abraham, "Get rid of Ishmael and Hagar." Because they will not inherit the blessings like with, with like my son Isaac. Now stop. What did I just tell y'all? Ishmael represents the law. Yes. Isaac represents grace. I didn't say that. Galatians says that. Now, no. And what did, what did Sarah say? Get rid of the bondwoman and her son. Get rid of the law. Because they will not inherit what my son inherited by faith. Amen. Amen. Mm. Let me give you another revelation. If you study the story of Abraham and Isaac Isaac was already off of the bottle literally before Ishmael was wow you gotta say it again <laughs> maybe you'll get the revelation yes. Yes. Isaac was already weaned from breastfeeding yes. before Ishmael was and Ishmael was the oldest hmm. what does that tell you mm-hmm. I'll give you an example how many people go to church every week and they shout and they run the aisles and they know the law back and forth. But when you meet them at Walmart, they don't tell you hi and they're mean as snakes. <laughs> wow. Why? Because they're immature. Yes. yes. Hallelujah. They still need the bottle. Yes. Because I know what some of y'all are thinking. Well, if you're, if you're saying we're not under the Ten Commandments, then how do I live a holy life? What is there to govern my life? See, that's your problem. Yes. That just reveals your immaturity. Because all your life you live by rules and regulations. Right. But when I snatch that from underneath you, the rug, now you're lost. Because yeah. that's what happened to me. When I first came to grace, the Lord began to reveal to me grace five years ago. That was my biggest problem. Is I said, okay, I'm not under the Ten Commandments. How do I live my life? And God says, you were never married to me. You've always been married to a system of rules. Yeah. But see, once I realized, Mary, that I, if I would just focus on love. The Bible says that love is the fulfillment of the law. Yes. Yeah. Mama G, if I love you, I ain't going to murder you. I ain't going to hate you. I ain't going to condemn you if I walk in love. You see, Mama G, I don't need no laws. If I just have the love of God, the love of God will fulfill whatever the law does. Are y'all with me? Yes, amen. And so you know what? I just thought that, hey, you know what? If we're going to inherit the blessings, Jamie, it's only going to be by grace. Amen. Amen. Does everybody understand? Yes. Amen. That's good. Amen. Should we move on? Yeah, go ahead. Next one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, mid number seven. That was my favorite one. <laughs> they say that uh, grace preachers ignore the Old Testament. Pastor Larry and Pastor Jamie ignore the Old Testament. No. No. Amen. Yeah, of course, we're not saying that. Amen. I want you all to go to Hebrews chapter 10. Now, the reason why this is said is because you know, we, 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 we teach that, you know, Pastor Larry, that we're, 
we're under a new covenant, right? We're under we're under a new system of doing things, right? Amen. And that that the old has passed away. And like I said a minute ago, that the law, brother Edward, is is obsolete, church. And so, you know, people will look at that and say, okay, well, you're saying that that we we should just ignore the Old Testament then, or that the Old Testament doesn't matter. Amen. And are we saying that? No. No. No, church, we're not. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse verse 1. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. Amen. It says, It says, For the law having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things. Mm, that's right it. there. That's it. You see, the the law, the law is just another word for the Old Testament. Okay. okay. Grace is just another word for the New Testament. Right. Law and grace, Old Testament, New Testament. He says, For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things. The Old Testament had a shadow of the good things, but it didn't have the substance, right? It didn't have the good things. Right. The actual good things. And it says, Can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually, year after year, make those who approach perfect. Amen. So what is he saying right there, Sister Mary? He's saying that all these sacrifices, these animal sacrifices, these, the blood of bulls and goats and rams that they brought year after year, can never, never make those who approach perfect. Right, man. But when Christ showed up on the scene, we talked about it when we were taking communion. When Christ showed up on the scene and he sacrificed his own body, and when he became the only sacrifice, the one and only sacrifice, that was enough, amen, to make you righteous. Amen. amen. So he's saying the things in the Old Testament were just a shadow. and and uh, But now we have the substance. Now we have Christ. We have the real thing, so to speak, now. It's like yeah. hope, the real yeah. thing, right? Um, and I always give this example. It's like if I was walking around a corner of a building or something and y'all were waiting for me, and uh, you, could, you would see my shadow, you know, coming from right. around the building. You would see my shadow first, right, if the sun was in the right spot. And... By looking at my shadow, you would be able to see, church, you know, a kind of a person that I would that I look like, right? Let's say you never saw me before. You can tell by my shadow that I'm, you know, a skinny guy, that I'm tall, or that, you know, maybe I was wearing spiky hair that day. You can tell all that from my shadow, but you'll never know the real me until I walk around that corner and you see me face to face. Amen. Amen. Yeah. So the Old Testament is like that. The Old Testament, Omar, is just like the shadow. But now that I've walked around that corner, you don't need to be looking and talking to my shadow anymore. Now you need to look at me and talk to me, right? Amen. Because Amen. the real thing is Amen. here. Yes. Amen. And so that's all That's all I'm saying. That's all Pastor Larry and I are saying. The Old Testament, it says it right here, was just the shadow of the good things to come. But now the good things, the actual things have shown up on the scene. So all of this, this old religious system, Brother Tim, has passed away already. It's vanished away because now Christ has shown up and now we have Christ. We have the real thing. Amen? Yeah, I just, I, all I would say is that we're not against the Old Testament. Well, the only thing about the Old Testament is that you have to bring Christ out of the shadows. You have to bring Christ from the shadows. Mm-hmm. You, know, you know, I'm going to say something just to kind of put this out there on the table. You know, I noticed that we live in a world today that, you know, uh, you know, people condemn homosexuality. They condemn that real bad, you know. And, so, and they're like, in the book of Leviticus, it says this. And I'm like, okay, why is it that Leviticus is comfortable for you when you're against somebody's lifestyle or their sin? But the book of Leviticus is never for you with the thing that you do wrong. <laughs> I think like in the same um, the scriptures, it says that you can't wear it to their friends. Yeah, um, it says, the same chapter and all that, it says about same-sex marriage and all that, it says that uh, men cannot shave their beards. Women, you cannot wear different fabrics. But we don't do that. You know what we do? We just isolate one verse and throw it at people. Mm. Instead of just reading the whole context. You know, in reality, Leviticus is the book of the law. And we're not under the law anymore. Amen. We're free from the law. And so what I'm saying is that it's okay to preach the Old Old Testament, but make sure you bring out Christ. Uh, if I can give an example, Pastor Jamie, how many of y'all know in Deuteronomy 28 it says, "I'll bless you in the city, I'll bless you in the fields, I'll bless your home. You'll be blessed coming in and out, right?" And we all say, "Hallelujah!" That's me. 
Okay, but wait. Because there's actually a condition for that verse. And the condition is that you have to keep all the law and the regulations. Yes. Now that's where the problem comes in. Because none of us can keep the law, right? right. Romans tells us that. Okay, but Larry, how, listen to me. This is, is going to help y'all. How do I interpret that verse? How do I bring that Old Testament verse into the New Covenant? This is the way you do it. First it says that if you want to be blessed in the field and all that, you have to obey the law. None of us could do that. So the way you see it from the New Covenant is that Christ fulfilled the law yes, for you and I so that we, we could receive the blessing. Yes, that's it. So you and I can claim Deuteronomy yes, 28 yes, that says yes. we're blessed in the field, blessed going in, blessed coming out. But Larry, it says that you have to obey the law. Well, I know that, but none of us could do it. Christ did it on our behalf. Yes. So right. when you read the Old Testament, you bring Christ out and say, I can, li- I can only have this because of Christ. Amen. Like David, you know and Sunday school classes for little for like little kids, they'll say, We can all be David. We can overcome our Goliath. You know, you don't have to be like your friend, you can be like David and make a difference. Okay. That's all beautiful and I love that. I love that. And there's nothing wrong with teaching kids that. The problem is is that that's not preaching the old covenant with Jesus on it. Because the Bible says that David's name means beloved. And I've and I've told you all this. Who is the only beloved son of God? Jesus, Jesus. Christ. And so David is actually a picture of, of Jesus. Jesus. Amen. What? Killing the Goliath, Satan. You see the you see what I'm trying to say? You yes. read the Old Testament with New Covenant glasses on. Yes. And so we're not denying the Old Covenant or the Old Testament. We're just saying when we preach the Old Testament, we try to find Jesus and pull it out. So so we, we don't ignore it. We we pull we find we see that Jesus is is the reason for the whole Old Testament. Amen. And uh, you have to do that, church. When you're reading your Old Testament, uh, like Larry said, you have to read it with New Testament glasses. Right? Right. You have to see that all of this stuff I'm reading has been fulfilled already. Why? Because Christ already came. Amen. Now we're living under the New Covenant. It's okay to read it, and it's okay. God will show you things from it, and you will get things from the Old Covenant. And we preach from the Old Covenant. We use Old Covenant scriptures as well. But you do it in a sense that it's all pointing to Christ because they were all shadows pointing to Christ. Even in the book of Genesis, you know, when Adam and Eve and, and all that stuff was pointing to Christ. The tabernacle, when Moses built the tabernacle in the Old Testament and, and um, you know, they offered the sacrifices, all that was a picture of Jesus Christ. Jesus is our tabernacle. He's our, he's our ark. You know, he's, he's all these things. It's all shadows pointing to Christ. President, mm-hmm. if, I, if I can ask you, I ask you a question, I'll let you yeah. this. Uh, take, for example, like, you know, some churches and, and, and faiths, they're big on people wearing prayer shawls, uh, the tallit. Uh, they like to blow the shofar. They like to celebrate all of the Old Testament festivals and wear the little thing on their head because they want to be Jewish. How do you explain that from a New Covenant mindset? I mean, I do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would say... I, I believe I believe that you I I wouldn't say that it's I'm not gonna say it's wrong to do those things, but I believe that it's pointless to do those things. I believe there's no point in doing it because all those things are a shadow of Christ. You know, why do we need a shadow when we have Christ? We have the substance, the Holy Spirit living inside of you. You know, blowing the show fire, what's the significance in that? You know, you may you may feel a sense of religious liberty whenever you do that. But that's all it is. It's just religious liberty. It's not you're not experiencing, you know, the, the true Holy Spirit in that. Amen. You don't have to do that. So and it's like I always say, Pastor Larry, I don't like doing things in my own personal life that there's no point in doing it because I feel like it's a waste of time. That's just me personally. That goes for life in general. And so I see like I see it I see it that way as well. Now if you're blowing a show fire at your house or if you're wearing a prayer shawl you know, I'm not condemning you to hell for doing that. Amen. If, if you want to do that, you know, then, then do it. But I'm saying that we don't need to do that. Amen. Amen. You don't you don't have to do that. There's no there's no significance in doing that and in, in observing the feasts and wearing the prayer shawl, blowing the shofar and stuff like that. You know, why do you want to be Jewish? You know, when you when you're a Christian, you know, we're Christians. And so, uh, uh, I mean. That's, I, I'm not explaining it anyway. That's, that's, no, yeah, that's I, just, I just thought that's good because that leads me to my next verse, which are, is Colossians chapter uh, Colossians chapter two, 
and I'll start with verse 16 for, for clarification. Colossians chapter 2, verse 16. It says, So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival, oh, there it is, or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are what? Verse 17. Which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is Christ. See, the substance is Christ. And the only thing I would add to what Pastor Jamie said is that all of us are Gentiles and none of us are Jews. So why are you wearing a prayer shawl if you're not Jewish? And there's no such thing as a Messianic Jew. There's no such thing as a Messianic Jew. Because when you're in Christ, the Bible says there's neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free. We're all one in Christ Jesus. Amen. You cannot be a new covenant believer and hold on to old covenant truth. Amen. You just can't do it. Amen. Amen. If, y'all, if y'all want to write this down, uh, I put it like this. I wrote it down. <coughs> the Old Testament is Christ concealed. And the New Testament is Christ revealed. Mm-hmm. Amen. Amen. So the Old Testament is Christ concealed. The New Testament is Christ revealed. Yeah. So in the Old Testament, it's almost as like Christ is hiding in a sense. You know, he's not. He hasn't been revealed yet. But the Bible says that at the right time, Jesus was born of a woman, born under the law, showed up on the scene, and 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 to do what? To save us from our sins, right? right. To die for us. And so in the in the New Testament, he's now revealed to us. Amen. 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 So, um, uh, uh, let me move along, Pastor Larry. Uh, and well, one more scripture, Luke, Luke twenty-four, verse twenty-seven. Amen. I hope you are getting something out of this. Amen. Luke twenty-four, verse twenty-seven. It says, uh, "This is after Jesus resurrected, and he says, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself." So, beginning at Moses, beginning at the prophets. So, he expounded in the scriptures things concerning himself. So Jesus opened up the scriptures to the to the apostles, and he he did what? He showed them scriptures concerning himself. Amen. So that's just proof right there that you know it shows that all the Old Testament scriptures point to point to Jesus. Amen. He did. Uh, Jesus didn't open up the Bible that you have in your hand. They didn't have no New Testament. You know, they didn't right. have that. They didn't. It wasn't even written yet. All they had was the Old Testament. All the the Moses and the prophets the minor prophets and all that stuff and so jesus opened up those things and he revealed himself to them so he was opening the eyes of the apostles he was saying you know look at all these scriptures all of these point to me look at david that points to me look at the tabernacle that points to me he's opening the scriptures and expounding things concerning himself okay so all that just just to say you know that the old testament is just a picture of jesus christ that's all it is it's just a story that points to jesus christ saying that christ is fixing to come He's going to come Amen. and he's going to save you from your sins. Amen. 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 Uh, if you just, an uh, example, like uh, how many how many of y'all were here one Sunday when I did uh, Abraham's, I did Adam's lineage. Remember we went through Adam gave birth to Seth and all that. Mm-hmm. I mean, Adam. Yes. And if, yes. you, if you go from Adam all the way to Noah and look up each of their names in the Bible dictionary, it tells you that Jesus came down because man was sorrow and he gave his life as the ultimate sacrifice. Yes. But you would never know that because you know what a lot of us do? So and so we got so and so. Oh, that, that's not important. Right, right, right. And really, there's a hidden message there. And I showed y'all that the other day. I'm only saying that just to tell y'all is that everything points to Christ. Everything. The, the Old Testament points to Christ. So just remember that. Amen. Amen. You want to? Do you want to do the? Do you want to start with the next? One? Okay. I'm uh, the uh, myth eight is disregard the words of Jesus. So, so critics say that you know, we disregard the words of Jesus. The words of Jesus, meaning his words in the um, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, yeah. I would say no. We don't disregard the words of Jesus. We keep them in their context. How many of y'all ever, let's say, Nora were to write Pastor Jamie a letter? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Turn the air conditioning down. Get heated up. Bro. <laughs> Let's say she were to write Pastor Jamie a letter, and she said, "You know how good of a pastor he was." And she, and, the, and in the middle, she just says, "I think you're handsome, and I just want you to know that I love you." And then she goes, "Oh, and let me tell you my last problem." And she writes the last problem, right? Well, let's say I read the letter, and the only part that I read that says, "And I love you," 
And let's say I start going around town and telling everybody, Nora loves me. Nora loves me. What did I just do to her letter? I took it out of context, yeah. right? See, a lot of us do that with the teachings of Jesus. We just take one scripture and we throw it over here. Okay, I'm going to throw a big one. Are you all ready? We've always been taught that we have to forgive in order to be forgiven. Why? Because Jesus said, unless you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will not forgive those trespasses, right? The problem is that that is old covenant. Because we don't forgive to be forgiven. We forgive because we're already forgiven. Yes. Are y'all with me? Now, in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, it says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, that they might receive the adoption of sons. So what am I saying? There are times that Jesus preached law, and there are times that Jesus preached grace. Are y'all with me? Yeah. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. Okay? Now, I'm going to use the big one. I'm going to use the one that I... I know people don't like this all the time, but I'm going to use, like, tithing. People say, Jesus taught tithing. Jesus said tithe. So we need to do what Jesus said. Well, Jesus was under the old covenant. Of course he's going to say the tithe. Yes. But after Jesus died, you never see any of the apostles mention tithing. Never. Why? Because that's old covenant. You see, you keep things in context the way Jesus read it. Are you sure what I'm trying to say? Yeah. I actually told the guys the other day, if you study tithing, tithing was for the Levitical priests and they weren't allowed to own any land. Yeah. But yet your preacher has a nice house and drives a nice car and he most of the time the pastor owns the house. Mm -hmm. Yet they want you to give 10% of your income. You're getting cheated, my friend. Because if you want to tithe the way that they did in the Old Testament, your preacher can't own anything. Because you're supposed to take care of him. You cannot own anything. But I guarantee some of the preachers, I'm not, I'm not hating on preachers, I'm just using an example. I'm sure some of the preachers, you go ask them, is your church tithe? Yeah, they're going to yeah, ask them, whose house is this under? They're going to say, well, it's under our name, because it's our house. No, it's our house, because we tithe it and gave it to you. If you study tithing, it's not actually ten percent; it's twenty-two and a third. Right. Mm -hmm. So y'all are all y'all are all not giving a tithe right. <laughs> the problem is, and let me tell you, and I and I told the guy because we have men's Bible studies on Tuesday nights, and I'm trying to teach the men to read the Bible and study their own. I told the men this: one of the biggest problems I see in the church, Mary, is a lot of people in the church they don't know the Old Testament. You only know your Bible stories like David, Goliath, and all that. But you don't know anything about how the tabernacle was made, what all it required, what were the laws that governed that tabernacle. Since we don't know those things, that's why when it comes to tithing, we just say, well, the preacher said, will a man rob God? Yet you rob me in tithes and offerings. Okay? Yes, the Bible says, will a man rob God? Yet you rob me in tithes and offerings. But I encourage you to go back to chapter 2. And he says, to the priest of Israel. It was for Israel. Mm -hmm. We're all Gentiles. Mm -hmm. And our, the Bible says, Paul says what? Give freely. Give cheerfully. Yes. Yes. From, a, from a loving heart. Yes. From a heart full yes. of compassion. Yes. You know, I remember when we started this church, and this, there were some people that knew that we didn't believe in tithing, and they told me straight out, how are you and Pastor Jamie going to make it? Y'all don't believe in tithing. You think your church is going to give? And I told the pastor. I said, Pastor, he, he's, I love this pastor. He's a very good man. I said, Pastor, I said, I know we don't agree on this topic, Pastor. I said, but let me tell you something. I really believe, and I could be wrong. We didn't have the church at the time. I said, but I could be wrong, but I really believe that if I just teach the people that, look, we got to pay the light bill. we got to pay the water bill. we got things that we need to do in order to run. And you know what? We have never lacked when it comes in this office. Because y'all always give faithfully Amen. to this church. And there's churches that are always beating the people. You need a tithe. You need a tithe. You need to give. You need to give. And you know what? I've never told y'all that. Pastor Jamie has never said that. We've always said what? Here's the offering box. Just give it. And y'all give. And so we just need to quit reading things from the Old Testament without understanding it through the New Testament. So there are some things that Jesus said 
But remember, look what the scripture says. Jesus was born under the law mm-hmm. to redeem those who were under the law. Mm-hmm. And I'm only using tithing as an example. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Have, you, have you ever been in a service where they pass around the collection plate like three times? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. We need a big offering, right? Yes. <laughs> Amen. So give y'all 10, all right? Church building fund. <laughs> building fund, they never build a building. Amen. Amen. Uh, <laughs> the building fund, you never see a building. Or the AC fund, you never see a, a new AC. <laughs> um, so, so, like, what we're trying to say with this one is that, you know, Jesus would say, like, some, he would say things to certain people in the old, in, in, um, in the Gospels, but then it would seem like he's kind of, it would almost seem like he's contradicting himself right. in other scriptures. Because, think about this, church. Think about, what came to my mind was think about the rich young ruler y'all know that story where the rich young ruler came to Jesus and said what must I do to inherit eternal life Mm -hmm. and Jesus what did Jesus tell him did he say just believe on me Mm -hmm. no he didn't say that that. he said keep the commandments keep the commandments he said you know the commandments don't steal don't kill and then uh, I won't go into any more of the story than that because the the rich young ruler said that he already keeps all these things and then jesus said you still lack one thing go and give everything you own sell it to the poor and then follow me and the rich young ruler went away sorrowfully the bible says because he couldn't do it so he actually wasn't keeping the first commandment which is love uh, or is it first or second commandment the first commandment the first commandment uh no other gods before me he was making his his money his inheritance his god and so yeah he can keep all the commandments but in reality he really couldn't because he couldn't keep the first main most important one literally which was to have no other god besides him and so okay but anyways so he told the rich young ruler to keep the commandment but now i want you to think about the the woman uh, um, the woman caught in adultery now when the woman caught in adultery pastor larry came to jesus jesus says um, where are those that accuse you? And she said, there's none. He said, neither do I accuse you or condemn you. Go and sin no more. So he didn't look at her, Sister Mary, and say, keep the commandments. Keep the commandments and that I won't condemn you. Keep the commandments and you'll, keep, you'll have eternal life. What did he do? He gave her grace. He gave her grace. He said, you know, I'm not going to condemn you and go and sin no more. Right. Y'all see yeah. the difference there? He, yeah. he approached it from two different angles. So the rich young ruler, he gave law to But the woman caught in adultery, he gave grace to. Now, why did he do that? Because let me tell you something. If you're a person that believes that we still need the law after all that we've taught you, we need the law to to have our standards in life. Well, I'm going to give you law then. I'm going to give you the law. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell you, if you look at a woman, like I said at the beginning, if you look at a woman of lust, you've already committed adultery. So have you done that? Yes. Okay. Well, then you're not keeping the law. And the Bible says if you break one law, Guilty you're guilty of breaking the entire law so you can't so that's what i'm trying to say you can't do it you can't do it there's no there's nothing you, you can't keep it no matter what amen but if you're like the woman who was caught in adultery who knew that she you know she she pretty much knew she needed jesus and she needed him well then god is going to give you grace amen, amen. so you have you have to be a, a humble you have to approach the lord humbly and say, I can't do it, Lord. You know, I need your grace to do it in this life, to make it in this life. I need you right. to make it in this life. Amen. Because if you if you come to God, Brother Edward, you know, boasting in your own self, boasting in your self effort, then God is going to step back and let you try to live the law. And you're going to what? You're going to ultimately fail yeah. because you yeah. can't keep it. And He's going to let you fail until you keep coming back to Him and saying, Lord, I just can't do it. You know, I need you to do it through me. Amen. Uh, I, all I would say is, Pastor Jamie says, if you break one of the laws, you're guilty of all, right? That's what he said. So here's the thing. Is lying, okay, is lying in the law, yes or no? Yes. Okay, is adultery in the law? Yes. yes. Okay, stop. So if you're guilty of one, you're guilty of the other, right? Yes. So if you lie, what does that make you? An adulteress. An adulteress. She got it. Mary got it. If you lie, you're, you're, you're guilty of adultery. Why? Because if you break one, then you're guilty of all of them. Yeah. So in other words, look, I'll go, let's get a little blunter. If you lie, then God sees you as a homosexual because you're guilty of all the law. <laughs> you see, that's why, church, we cannot live by the law. It's going to take God's grace, baby, yeah. for us to make it to, to heaven. Yeah. Right. So, let's do it, Pastor Jane. I'll look at it. Yeah. 
we're good. We're good? Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, <laughs> give the Lord a hand clap. Amen. 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 Why don't we stand?